Hi everybody, so I'm on a roll, I'm making another physics video and it's going to link very closely to another physics video I made which is to do with weight and mass and I'm going to talk, be talking today about forces in greater detail. Let's quickly summarise, remember a force is something which is either a push or a pull and it causes an object to speed up, change direction or change its shape. Now, remember that force is measured in newtons and that you often see a force diagram and that's basically an object which is moving and it will have arrows and the size of the arrow represents how large the force is so obviously the larger the arrow the larger the force remember in um, your textbook I'll often talk about balanced forces that is when two forces acting on an object they'll be acting in opposite directions to each other and remember that they have to be the same size for them to be balanced forces and that basically means that an object which is standing still, i.e. stationary, it won't speed up, it will stay exactly as it is. And it also means that an object which is travelling at a certain speed, when it has balanced forces acting on it, will continue to travel at that speed. It won't speed up, it won't slow down. So therefore, if we're talking about unbalanced forces, it makes sense that one of the forces opposing the other force is larger than the other. So if the object is stationary, it will start moving. And if the object is travelling at a certain speed, it will either speed up or slow down. So, what are these forces that we're talking about? I'm going to use the example of a car driving along the street to help illustrate this. So, you have a car, it's sat on the tarmac and it's driving. So the forward force is going to be the driving force from the engine. And that will be causing the car to either accelerate or just carry on travelling at the same speed. Opposing that driving force will be several other forces. First of all, air resistance, otherwise known as drag. Now what is that? Basically, if you've got a car moving, you've got air whistling past it, and these air particles, they'll collide with the car and they generate a tiny, tiny force which acts in the opposite direction to the direction the car's travelling. And by doing that, they oppose the motion of the car, so they act to slow it down. So each air particle that hits will slow down the car and overall there will be so many particles, millions of particles hitting, that the force can be quite large. So the faster the car, the larger the drag, the larger the air resistance. And that's because more particles are hitting per second. And air resistance and drag helps to explain the shape of certain cars. So certain sports cars um, will be a special shape, they'll be streamlined. And that's because the air is deflected upwards off the windscreen rather than hitting the car and slowing it down. Um, we have lots of other forces opposing motion, so there's friction. Remember, friction is the force that occurs between surfaces, so the friction in this example will be between the car wheels and the road. So remember, it's that friction which is useful because it allow allows the car to grip onto the road, and in certain conditions, like icy conditions, wet conditions, or if the tyres have been too worn, you'll decrease the friction between the tyres and the road, and that can lead to dangerous occurrences like the car skidding. So a bit of friction is important. You have other forces acting on the car. You have weight. Remember, that's the downward force due to gravity. And don't forget this force. It's called the normal reaction. And that occurs between the tyres and the road surface. And it occurs upwards, so perpendicular to the road. And basically, all the normal reaction is, is it's the force which stops objects kind of being forced into the earth. So it acts against gravity. That's quite a hard one to imagine, but just remember that it occurs at 90 degrees to the surface. Um, right, so I've talked about all the different forces I wanted to talk about with this example. Now we're going to talk about terminal velocity, because this tends to be a pretty sticky, horrible topic. So remember, when we're talking about terminal velocity, we tend to use the example of a parachutist jumping out of an aeroplane. And you'll often see lots of diagrams of arrows of different sizes. I'm going to try and talk to you about that now. So, let's start at the top. We're starting in our aeroplane and our parachutist is looking out and he's about to jump. The moment he jumps, the only force acting on him is weight. So that will cause him to accelerate towards the Earth's surface. Now, the faster he accelerates, the, the bigger the air resistance. Because remember, as he's dropping, he's going to be hitting lots of air. And that, those air particles are going to be acting in the opposite direction to his motion, trying to slow him down. And the faster he travels the more particles will be hitting per second. So the overall force of drag or air resistance will become very large. So at a certain point, you will find that the size of the air resistance or the drag will match the, the size of the weight force acting downwards. And we call that terminal velocity because all that means is that the two forces are balanced 
and the parachutist will no longer accelerate. He'll just continue falling at a constant speed. And that is what tunnel velocity is basically, neither accelerating or decelerating, just travelling at a constant speed. Before too long, the parachutist will choose to open his parachute because he won't obviously want to splatter on the ground. When he opens his parachute, you see a massive increase in the surface area of the parachutist and therefore way more air particles will be, will be trapped inside the parachute and therefore air resistance will increase hugely and he'll jerk upwards as a result of that and you'll see that he'll slow down. However, because his speed decreases, that actually causes air resistance to decrease because if you think about it, the slower he now travels, the fewer air particles will be hitting him and opposing his motion and therefore he'll slow down. And eventually his weight and the size of the drag air resistance force will become the same and we call that terminal velocity again because he's now travelling at a constant speed. Now remember that terminal velocity will be at a much lower speed than the initial one and that's due to the fact he's opened up his parachute. I really hope that's cleared up some of your difficulties with forces in general and terminal velocity. As always, big thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Um, I hope you found it helpful and I'll see you guys next time. See ya!